Good afternoon. My name is Ron Lucy. I'm the executive director of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Welcome to our presentation, Respect and People with Disabilities, as part of the Texas Association of Healthcare Interpreters and Translators Conference. Joining me today is uh, my co-presenter, Randy Turner, our Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, Accessibility and Disability Rights Coordinator. Before we get started, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. The Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities is an advisory committee to uh, the governor and the Texas legislature. We have 12 members appointed by Governor Greg Abbott and at least seven of those members must be Texans with a disability. We're the only agency that looks at disability issues from a cross disability perspective and that unique perspectives help, helps us serve as the voice of Texans with disabilities at the Capitol. Next slide. All right, Randy, could you lead us in on the learning objectives? Sure thing, Ron. Uh, leave with disability etiquette tips and terminology. So we will go through some examples today learn about people first language and how to work with people who may look different, have vision loss, are deaf or hard of hearing, use mobility devices and more. And leave with resources to help you further interact with people with disability. All right, before we get into those great communication tips and strategies, we need to talk about who are people with disabilities. The most common definition used uh, to define a person with a disability is the definition under the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA. And under the ADA, a person with a disability is an individual who has a physical or mental impairment that significantly limits one or more of life's major activities, such as walking, hearing, speaking, uh, seeing. Uh, the second part of the definition is uh, an individual who has a record of such an impairment. And then finally, the third one is an individual who is regarded as having such an impairment. Uh, the regarded as clause may be that somebody believes they have a disability because of uh, their appearance, but they don't necessarily have uh, an impairment which significantly limits one or more of life's major activities. All right, next slide. All right, so Randy, who are people with disabilities? People with disabilities are everyone. Everyone we see every day. You can't just recognize someone with a disability by what they look like. It uh, could be an individual with a sensory disability like deafness or blindness. Uh, there are also, uh, we do have a pretty decent sized population of deafblind here in Texas, uh, low vision and people who are hard of hearing. People with a physical disability could be an ortho orthopedic or a mobility disability. Uh, people with an intellectual disability could be developmental disability or a learning disability, could be a traumatic brain injury from an accident of some sort. And people with hidden disabilities, um, emotional disabilities, cardiac, immune systems, uh, Ron, you want to give us some, uh, some more examples of hidden disability? Yeah, so hidden disability, often people assume that a, a person with disability must look a certain way, like most people with disabilities use a wheelchair. That's obviously not the case. Uh, you might see somebody pull into a handicapped parking space and get out and uh, walk into the grocery store or the drugstore. And it may be that that person has arthritis, uh, which makes walking longer distances very difficult for them, or it may be that they have a heart condition, a cardiac issue where they're not able to walk long distances and they need that accessible parking. Other uh, disabilities, a uh, person who has a vision impairment or low vision may not travel with a cane, uh, but they still uh, need assistance uh, or, or they have a vision impairment which uh, significantly limits one or more of life's major activities as we described under the ADA. All right, next slide. So now that we know who we're referring to when we talk about people with disabilities, let's talk about some communication strategies uh, to help you communicate like a pro with people with disabilities. Uh, there's a uh, concept called people first language, also known as people first respectful language. And people first language is not being politically correct. Uh, it's a way of uh, emphasizing each person's value and individuality and capabilities. It's a communication philosophy uh, that eliminates stereotypes, 
uh, and negative assumptions and generalizations by uh, focusing on the person rather than their disability. And uh, Randy, there's a cartoon over on the right uh, where a person is asking an ind individual in a wheelchair how they'd like to be regarded. Can you uh, go ahead and describe that cartoon? Absolutely. So there is an individual asking, so what do you prefer to be called? Handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? And the respondent who is, uses a wheelchair says, Joe would be fine. <laughs> and the caption below says, the most appropriate label is usually the one person's parent's name, or the one person's parents have given them. Um, so their name, of course, Joe. So I have a disability and uh, people often refer to me as Ron, not disabled Ron or uh, blind or visually impaired Ron, but just Ron. Uh, don't reference the disability unless it's relevant to the conversation. All right, next slide. So why is language so important, Randy? Uh, well, language is how we communicate. It's how we convey messages. And so it can create barriers or opportunities for people in general. It can foster an academic of, uh, epidemic of ignorance or celebrate differences. Uh, there so, are some, um, go ahead, Ron. I was just going to add that there's a lot in body language, too. It's not just uh, the words we use, but how we say things as well as how we come across um, in our body language. Ahead, so all of us are familiar with uh, barriers in the uh, built environment. Uh, if a person encounters a flight of stairs and uh, they use a wheelchair, that would be a barrier to them getting into that building. Uh, but attitudinal barriers are some of the greatest barriers that people with disabilities encounter in life. And our language shapes our attitudes towards people with disabilities. And that's why we want to uh, focus on uh, eliminating those uh, old ways of communicating and replace them with uh, people first respectful language. All right, next slide. So uh, body language, you were talking about body language and uh, disability etiquette. What are some important uh, ways that people with disabilities regard themselves when it comes to uh, uh, self-identity? Well, they are not their disability and they treasure their independence. And they are the experts when it comes to what accommodation they might need. So don't make assumptions just because somebody is, has a hearing loss like deafness that they need an interpreter. They may not, they may use captioning instead. They may prefer writing back and forth. Uh, so they are the experts, ask them what kinds of accommodations they might need. So I think one of the reasons why members of the public may be so uncomfortable in approaching a person with a disability is they're not sure what to do. So uh, anytime you interact with a person with a disability, at least one of you is an expert on that disability. And of course, that's the person with a disability. So when you're not sure, just ask. And we're going to get a little bit more guidance on what that means to just ask. This is a video which I think is very well put together. Uh, on interpersonal interaction uh, between a person uh, with a disability and, and an individual who at first is not sure how to interact with people with disabilities. And so Randy, when we start this, be sure to share the, uh, the video uh, and uh, check the check boxes so that our audience yes, can. Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and uh, start the video. Good morning, Mom. Good morning there, big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay. You'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. 
what you think might be helping. I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take mine? Sure. <laughs> Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't address me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind. May I help you? Does not mean I'm deaf. I don't know. I think he said he was going to come. But... Just because I'm deaf. Doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath. Relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, dear ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi. Would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no, thanks. But can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Alice. Morning. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. I think there's times when all of us have felt like Bob where we weren't quite sure how to handle a social situation, but hopefully at the end of this training, uh, you'll be equipped with the uh, skills and communication strategies you'll need to feel less like Bob. So let's talk a little bit about some uh, terminology uh, that has uh, ended up being thrown on the trash heap of, of uh, history as unacceptable language uh, and some uh, terms that have been used to replace this. Uh, so we've got use people first language, uh, do not refer to the person's disability unless it's relevant. Uh, another strategy is use disability instead of handicapped. And you know, it's interesting, earlier I talked about handicapped parking. There's still a couple of places where a term is literally in statute, uh, where our Texas Transportation Code will talk about handicapped parking and uh, not all terminology is always brought up to date at the same time. Uh, don't use normal or uh, able-bodied uh, for uh, people who do not have uh, disabilities, use people without disabilities. Uh, and then avoid terms like the disabled. Uh, it's kind of an exclusionary way of referring to a group of people. The epileptic, the blind, uh, special schools, uh, different abled, handicapped, or special bus. All right, next slide, Randy. All right, let's talk about physical access. Uh, one of the things we saw in the video that uh, resonated with me, I had a coworker who uh, used a wheelchair and occasionally walked with crutches and she had the same thing happen to her. She was uh, coming into our building at, at an, uh, my previous job and somebody who wanted to help her uh, tried to open the door for her just as she was leaning on that door to stabilize herself. And she ended up falling and getting hurt and missed about a month worth of work. So uh, remember, just ask. But uh, when somebody does have a wheelchair, a wheelchair is a part of that person's body space or individual space. So don't lean on their wheelchair or touch their wheelchair in the same way that you wouldn't lean on another person's body or touch that person's body or invade their personal space. 
remember that pushing a wheelchair is a skill and not everybody has that skill or has been asked by the person who uses the chair uh, for that assistance. Uh, if you're going to have a longer conversation with a person uh, who uses a wheelchair, sit at eye level, either take a knee or go find a chair and bring it over uh, so that uh, when you have that conversation, the person in the wheelchair doesn't have to uh, crane their neck and look up at you for a long period of time. Offer assistance anytime you think it's necessary, but also be prepared uh, that they might decline your assistance. Uh, keep paths clear uh, inside and outside buildings. If you're going to schedule a meeting with a person with a mobility impairment, make sure that the meeting location is accessible and has an accessible path of travel. And finally, uh, we talked about handicap parking, also known as accessible parking. Uh, make sure that you reserve that uh, accessible parking for people uh, that need it. I believe one in 25 parking spots at shopping centers are uh, reserved as accessible parking spaces. So as you can see, that's not very many. There are a greater number of spots required at hospitals or medical clinics, but still, uh, Remember that uh, a person who has a handicapped parking placard needs that space. And if somebody takes it who doesn't need it, it could limit their ability to participate in the community. Next uh, slide, I'd Randy. I'd like to add just one little comment about sure. outside buildings, especially now with COVID. Uh, a lot of the medical facilities have tables set up outside. So make sure that path of travel around that table is still accessible for the individual that might need to that uses a wheelchair or crutches or a walker to get by. Sometimes that's, it's a pretty tight squeeze. That's a great point. I remember just being at Austin Regional Clinic uh, last week with my son and they ha had a place where they asked to take your temperature or ask you COVID questions and uh, that table can't be blocking the entrance to uh, the clinic. Okay, blindness or low vision. All right, so a couple of interaction tips. Uh, when you uh, enter a room where uh, somebody who's blind is located, identify yourself and others that are with you. Uh, hi, Jeff, this is Ron. I'm here with Randy. Uh, never touch or grab uh, their uh, their cane, their white cane, or pet their service animal. Remember, a service animal or a guide dog is a working animal, and it can be distracted if you pet it. Uh, don't assume that they need help. Uh, many people who are blind are very independent and uh, go about their lives with little or no uh, extra assistance. Uh, offer your arm or elbow uh, if uh, they need uh, mobility assistance. That's called being a sighted guide. So uh, if I were to say, Randy, do you need uh, sighted assistance to uh, find the meeting room or the conference room? And Randy were to say yes, I would extend my elbow and Randy would grab my elbow and hold right above my elbow on my arm. And then you would just walk at a normal pace. If you were going through a narrow area, you might drop your arm behind your back to indicate that <coughs> you're uh, going through a narrow area and certainly give verbal cues like we're about to approach some stairs or go down some steps. Um, also, let them know when uh, you're leaving a room, same way that you uh, let them know when you're coming in. Uh, and then finally, uh, face them when you're talking uh, to them or speaking with them and speak with the person who's blind, not the person that uh, might be accompanying them. All right, next slide. Randy, you wanna take uh, speech impairments? Sure, sure. So some interaction tips for people with speech impairments. Allow them to speak. Um, it may be a little difficult to understand, so you might have to really listen closely, uh, be uh, more attentive than um, maybe in other situations. Seek a quiet setting so that you can hear them really well. Don't complete their sentences for them, let them go ahead and complete what they're trying to say. They may be searching for the right word. Um, if it's a cognitive uh, impairment, uh, a cognitive disability that's causing the speech impairment. Uh, listen to the person's words. Uh, use a normal tone of voice. So you don't need to raise your voice or talk loud or re-emphasize uh, your lip movements or anything like that. Uh, don't pretend to understand if you don't and ask the person how to best communicate with them instead of guessing. If you're not sure what you've heard, repeat it back for confirmation. 
then you can also ask them to repeat back to you if you didn't understand them or to rephrase um, the statement that they said. And if necessary, ask them if they want to use a computer to communicate. Or today, you know, you could use your cell phone and you could text back and forth on the phone or something if it was really, really needed. But those are some options for interaction. So them. people with a speech impairment may uh, use something called an augmentative communication device. And back in the day, that was a very expensive dedicated communication board that had icons. Uh, and when the person pressed that icon, it would uh, communicate a phrase using synthetic speech or pre-recorded wave file. Today, it's something as simple as an iPad uh, that can be used as a, a augmentative communication device to help the person who has a speech impairment uh, communicate and be better understood. Intellectual disability. Ron, you want to take this one? Sure. So in interacting with a person with an intellectual or cognitive disability, don't make any assumptions. Uh, uh, allow extra time for processing information if needed. Uh, you might want to slow down the uh, pace of the communication. Uh, use clear, simple language. Don't communicate in idiomatic expressions like uh, in our Driving with Autism initiative, we uh, encourage peace officers when they're pulling over a person who may be on the autism spectrum to avoid expressions like, why are you flying down the road or where's the fire? Instead, just say things like, why were you speeding? Uh, don't take lack of uh, response personally. Uh, they may just be overwhelmed when you're communicating. Uh, don't take uh, sudden emotional, uh, sudden emotions personally. Uh, th there may be uh, an emotional reaction that is uh, uh, more excited than you're expecting, or uh, and that just is part of the uh, spectrum of that disability. Uh, direct eye contact can be uh, intimidating to the individual uh, with an intellectual disability. Uh, so if they're looking away, uh, that may you may think that that's lack of interest and that might just be how they're handling the uh, communication. Allow for uh, different styles of processing uh, of information. You may uh, find that the person uh, has a lot of questions to clarify what they're understanding, or as I mentioned, they may be looking away, but they're still processing and understanding things. Okay, next slide. Speaking with people who are hard of hearing, and I've, I've worked with the uh, deaf and hard of hearing community for over 30 years, but I also live with somebody who is hard of hearing. So I have a lot of expertise in this area on the receiving end. So first get their attention. Uh, that could be a little tap on the shoulder or just get in their line of sight so that they know you're there. Uh, maintain a clear view of your face. So we talked earlier about body language, facial expression is all very important important, but also being able to catch your lips. Uh, the best lip reading ability is only 30 or 40 percent. So there's still a lot that can be lost in the conversation if the individual does not understand the topic. So uh, make sure that you don't have anything in front of your mouth. Speak clearly and at a moderate rate. If you speak too fast or you over accentuate your mouth movements, it distorts it and it makes it even more difficult to understand. Avoid noisy environments because if someone's wearing hearing aids, for example, the hearing aids are going to pick up not only your voice, but uh, the loud noises around you. So if there's a vacuum cleaner going down the hall, that's loud. The air conditioning system can be loud. So try to find a, a quiet place to meet and rephrase when not understood. So an example of rephrasing something is I had a um, I'll give you a story. So my husband and I were um, at the last concert for our daughter when she was a freshman in high school playing the violin. And I, we were leaving this large auditorium. So, you know, people standing up, starting to talk and then chairs banging down, you know, making lots of noise. And he was standing behind me. And I said, our baby's growing up. And I turned, to, I, he said, he literally threw his hands out and said, where? and had this like star look on his face. And I said, what did you think I said? He thought I said, a baby is throwing up. So <laughs> we can have miscommunications really, really easy 
And that's just the simple stuff. So if you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to um, communicate really effectively with somebody hard of hearing, just ask, just like the video said. Okay, and we're going to see a, a very short video called Let's Make It Clear. And this uh, reinforces a lot of the tips that uh, Ms. Turner just gave us. Okay, you can see this, correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. We're just going to play a little bit of this video, but you are welcome to click on the link when you get the uh, materials and watch the entire thing. Hi today, and he'll be with you in a little bit, so just have a seat, please. All right, thanks. Your name? I'm sorry, were you talking to me? Your name. My name? You do have an appointment, don't you? Kent. My name is Louise Kent. And do you have an appointment? Oh, yes, I have an appointment at, at 2 o'clock. Well, the doctor's very busy today, and he's running a bit behind, so if you could just have a seat. You can have a seat now, Miss Kent. Doctor will be with you in about 15 minutes. 50 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Around 15 minutes. Uh, please just have a seat. I'll... Do you mean 15 minutes as in a quarter of an hour, or 50 minutes as in almost an hour? 15 minutes as in a quarter of an hour. Please. So I'm going to stop here and you can see how communication was challenging. One second, we need to get all of our captioning up and the PowerPoint back up. Um, the receptionist was doing multiple things at one time, so was constantly turning her head, which made it difficult for the patient to be able to understand her. In addition, um, she was chewing gum and that made it more difficult as well. You may not think about it that way, but it does change what your lips are doing. In the end, she ends up adding more light to her workstation, not trying to multitask, making sure she's looking at the person when she is communicating with individuals. But this whole video is a really good, gives a lot of good examples of how to communicate more effectively with people who are hard of hearing. Yeah, I love this series. And if you can find it on YouTube, uh, there's uh, uh, several mm -hmm. videos in this series that are in a healthcare setting, which is perfect for the Texas Association of Healthcare Interpreters and Tra Translators. And uh, the most important element of good customer service is be in the moment with your customer give them your complete undivided attention. And I like to say in this situation, uh, the receptionist uh, gave the customer her, her complete divided attention. Yeah. <laughs> so communicating with people who are deaf and use sign language. Um, American Sign Language is not English and being interpreters of other languages, I'm sure you know that that's true in lots of languages. The syntax, the word order, the structure is different from language to language. And it is true with American Sign Language too. A lot of people think that ASL is just English in, in sign, but it's not. It has its own grammatical characteristics. Use of American Sign Language interpreters is also really important to make sure that you have effective communication with your patients. On the slide, you will see a link to the Health and Human Service Office for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services website, where you can actually search for interpreters by region, by certification level, and so forth. Um, so Rand Randy, can you go a little bit more? Why isn't it just good enough to just write everything out in, in, in English for people who are deaf? Uh, can't they just read everything using either CART or just passing notes back and forth? Well, the mean for deaf individuals that graduate high school, the reading level is fourth grade. So 50% of the population reads above fourth grade, 50% reads below. So another respectful thing to do is look at the reading levels on your websites. Is your reading level too high for the materials that you're giving for discharge papers, for medical documentation or information forms that they have to fill out? Is this at a level that they can understand? because often it is not. And thus American Sign Language interpreters, qualified interpreters are gonna help make communication effective. Other uh, strategies you might use are offer notes 
um, or note takers. So if somebody, if they, you are meeting with an individual and it's lengthy, you may want someone to take notes for them because if they're looking up at the interpreter, they cannot also look down and make notes. If there are written materials that they can look at in advance, that could be helpful. And keep writing simple when you do have to communicate. Just like Ron was talking earlier, don't use things that have double meanings, idiomatic expression, expressions, uh, even simple terms like surgery instead of operation. Little changes like that can really make a difference in how your communication comes across and if it's effective or not. And uh, one last thing on video relay service. This is used to interpret phone calls. So if I'm, uh, you may receive phone calls at your office through VRS where there is an actual interpreter that the deaf individual can see through video technology interpreting for them to you, the hearing person. And uh, video relay service is very effective uh, for many situations. It cannot be used for some things like in-person interpreting. It is not to be used in replacement of video remote interpreting. And our next slide is what you see on the screen today. Communication access real-time translation are also known as CART. And CART is performed by certified CART reporters that use real-time uh, translation technology. Uh, it's a Steno machine, notebook computer, and real-time translation software. You can find a list of CART reporters at the Texas Court Reporters Association website, and the link is on the screen for you. Ron, testing our understanding. All right, so we've learned a lot and we're gonna check in with each of you to see how you're doing. So I'm gonna read the don't use and Randy's gonna replace it with instead use. So the first one is he's mentally retarded. Uh, don't use that. What should we do instead? We say he has an intellectual disability. Okay, uh, referring to somebody as the autistic. What's the correct way to refer to somebody? With autism. Okay. He's a Downs kid. A person who has Down syndrome. Okay. Don't say a victim of epilepsy. Instead say. A person who has epilepsy. Okay. Don't use the mentally ill or the emotionally disturbed. Instead, we should say. A person with mental illness. Okay. And don't say a person who is wheelchair bound. Instead say. A person who uses a wheelchair. All right, that seems pretty straightforward. Pretty simple. All right, so one of the most significant ways that businesses, organizations, and hospitals communicate with their customers is through uh, information and communication technology, such as a, a hospital's website or social media. And when we talk about communicating through technology, remember that accessibility is good customer service. When you make your uh, information accessible, it helps people with disabilities access the same information, receive the same services, uh, operate the same functionality, and achieve the same goals and outcomes as people without disabilities. So often there'll be patient intake forms at, at your hospital's website. Uh, there may be a way to uh, make an appointment or uh, have that patient check their medical records. And, you need to make sure that all of those uh, uh, functionalities are accessible to people with disabilities who use assistive technology. All right. Uh, another very common thing that uh, takes place today is communicating virtually during uh, COVID. Normally, we would be giving this presentation at the Tahit conference in person. Uh, and it's uh, very common these days for these types of presentations to happen using uh, virtual meeting tools uh, or webinar tools. The most important thing to do to make sure that your uh, virtual meetings or presentations are accessible is to pick an accessible platform. And two examples of accessible platforms are Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Uh, how do you know if a platform is accessible? Well, what you can do is ask the vendor who sells that platform to provide you with something called a VPAT or Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. It's a disclosure sheet that uh, talks about whether the uh, uh, technology is accessible or not accessible. Also, uh, there's some 
tips for how you can optimize the accessibility of your presentation when you pick an accessible tool. And Randy, could you share a couple of those tips? Sure can. Uh, the first one I think is to ensure that you've got captioning to make sure that it's accessible to people with hearing loss. Um, that will help a lot of people. And there are a lot of people out there that have hearing loss that don't admit it. So it's gonna help more than you really think. The other thing is to provide sign language interpreters and you can spotlight your interpreters. We use the Zoom platform. So this is a great tool that actually highlights the interpreter so that they're seen by participants, no matter what's going on the screen, as well as it is in the recording. And we also encourage when you can to add audio description. We have an example of this at our website where we recorded our 30 year anniversary ADA presentation and um, added audio description during the session. Uh, Ron, do you wanna give a brief explanation of what that is? Yeah, very briefly, audio description is an accommodation for people who are blind or have a vision impairment. And often it's achieved by using a secondary audio channel or the person may dial into a, a separate phone number and uh, there's a trained professional who describes the visual elements of what you're seeing on the screen. If it's uh, a bar graph or pie chart, they will describe uh, what each element of that chart or uh, graph represents. If it's uh, uh, a presentation about art, they might describe what the art on the screen looks like, uh, but it, it's done in a way that doesn't interfere with the audio narration of the presentation, but complements it uh, and adds additional access and information to people who are blind. And at a time when we're doing so much virtual, uh, so many virtual meetings, I, you know, I meet with my doctor virtually, I'm sure you're providing, the medical field is providing uh, diabetes education and a number of other courses to, through the same method. These are great tools to implement to make sure that your sessions are accessible. I'd say one quick example where we did audio description is where I had Randy describe the cartoon earlier in the presentation of the person who said I'd prefer to be known as Joe. If we had not described that in the way that we did it, a uh, person who's blind who is experiencing this presentation would have just missed that. All right, uh, giving accessible presentations. Uh, so one of the things you wanna do when making an accessible presentation is plan ahead to meet the uh, needs of all audience members. If it's gonna be a live presentation in a live venue, make sure you pick a venue that's in a, an accessible location. If uh, somebody has a hearing impairment, you might wanna make sure there's an FM loop system uh, or the ability uh, to accommodate an assistive listening device. Uh, you uh, want to uh, ask in the meeting invitation if people uh, or participants need an accommodation to contact your organization or the organization hosting the presentation X number of days in advance uh, so that you have time to plan for that accommodation. You wanna ensure that the uh, presentation environment is accessible as we talked about, and then also uh, make sure that the um, meeting materials or presentation materials are accessible. And we have a link to the Texas Health and Human Services Commission's Accessibility Center website. It's a, a website that I helped establish earlier on in my career, and it continues to be a great resource for state agencies and for the general public on how to make PowerPoint presentations and other presentations accessible. All right, next slide. So uh, the indispensable truth of accessibility is that uh, for most people, technology makes things easier, but for people with disabilities, technology makes life possible. Uh, and that's a quote from Mary Pat uh, uh, Radenberg, uh, who's a former IBM employee in their accessibility center. Now, the truth is that assistive technologies like you see up here, Zoom text, uh, the JAWS screen reader or drag and dictate, those are great assistive technologies for people with disabilities, but they only work if you do your part. And that's uh, making sure that your websites are accessible. We, I, I call those digital curb cuts, making sure that there are text descriptions of images on your website or uh, that your forms on your website uh, have form labels that can be read and detected by assistive technology. And so that would require an entire separate presentation to get into those strategies, but we're gonna provide you with resources to guide you on to further learning. 
Next slide. All right, so uh, the measuring stick that we use to achieve accessibility for websites and information and communication technology is called the Web Content Accessibility Standards or WCAG 2.1. And WCAG was created by the World Wide Web Consortium uh, in the Web Accessibility Initiative, or the W3C. And it's a platform and technology neutral uh, standard. Uh, in other words, as technology advances, the standards continue to apply. They are built on four basic tenets that technology needs to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Uh, and it's um, an international standard in that as uh, the United States and uh, governments around the globe adopt the standard, it keeps uh, companies from having to develop different technology for different markets. Uh, if every company like Microsoft develops their technology to the WCAG standard, it will be deemed accessible in all markets. And it's uh, finally used by the US Department of Justice and the state of Texas as our benchmark or measuring stick for accessibility. So if you wanna learn more for your organization or direct your webmaster for your, your hospital to uh, how to make sure that your technology is accessible, you can go to www.wu3.org or follow the link at the bottom of the page. Next slide. Finally, we have some great resources here for you for further learning. We have the Texas Governor's Committee's Key Laws and Resources webpage. Uh, we have our uh, an entire three-page uh, brochure on people-first respectful language that's hosted by the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. And we have uh, tips on interacting with people with disabilities. And finally, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the Electronic and Information Resources Accessibility Center website hosted by the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. All right, Les, that, wraps it up. Wow. that sure does. Well, Randy, thank you for having me be a part of this. And this is the point where we would take questions from the audience. Uh, since uh, this is a pre-recorded presentation, we've got an email address for you to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>